Questions without notice. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, the question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, given the strife that the Treasurer has got you into with his own $3 billion budgetary crater, will the Prime Minister make it absolutely clear to this House that not one dollar of the $4.5 billion commitment the government has already earmarked in the next budget for superannuation contributions or related private savings assistance will be raided to fill the Costello crater, knowing that public saving at the expense of private saving is worthless? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr uh, Speaker, in reply to the Leader of the Opposition, can I say that I have nothing to add to what the Treasurer and I have said on this matter already? The order. The Honourable Member for Capricornia. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Family Services. Can the Minister inform the House of the status of the trials of Medicare agencies in pharmacies are about to commence in Queensland, including my electorate of Capricornia. How will these agencies work? What benefits will they have for the men and women who live in rural and remote parts of Australia who now do not have the easy access to Medicare services because of Labor's previous neglect? The Honourable Minister for Health and Family Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for his question, and I'm delighted to be able to answer his question, given the representation that he and other members of rural seats have made about the issue of trying to access Medicare claims. I'm delighted to inform Honourable Members that uh, trials are about to start in five locations in Queensland of claiming for Medicare through pharmacies. We will be trialling a prototype easy claim system in Dysart, Blackwater, Claremont, Terry and Springshaw in the electorates of Capricornia and Maranoa. We expect it to begin in about two weeks' time. It will be a self-service machine located in participating pharmacies. People will be able to send their claim form and accounts on a dedicated line to the Health Insurance Commission. The pharmacies will then forward original copies to the Health Insurance Commission for their record and payment will be made directly to people's bank accounts. It is a big step in giving people in rural and remote areas access to something that people in cities have taken absolutely for granted. Mm -hmm. Pharmacies will pay a small fee to have the facilities involved, recognising there is a substantial potential benefit to them in the form of customers' access across their front door. These trials will be brief, they will be fully evaluated, and we would expect to have 130 such machines located in pharmacies by July this year and 400 in pharmacies across Australia over the next four years. We are using a number of criteria to determine the location in pharmacies, particularly pharmacies in um, receipt of the isolated and remote pharmacy allowance, Medicare claiming patterns in the area and the enthusiasm of the pharmacies themselves for having the facility. I'm delighted we've been able to get this up and running. It will be a major advance for people in rural areas in having access to Medicare, and uh, it's good to be putting something into rural communities. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Has the Prime Minister focused on the fact that yesterday's retail figures were the biggest three-month fall in 13 years since around the time he was last in office, represented the worst sustained decline since the Menzies credit squeeze of the early 1960s, and according to Westpac and others yesterday, are likely to produce a zero growth outcome for the December quarter, bringing to an end 21 quarters of consecutive growth. In the view from Kirribilli, is this all part of the rare conjunction of positive circumstances you say that we're enjoying? The Honourable Prime Minister. Order. 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 Members uh, on my right. Can I say to um, Order. Can, I, can I say to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that um, the uh, the retail sales figures, uh, of course, uh, are uh, an indicator, uh, along with a lot of other indicators uh, of activity and movements in the economy. I draw the Deputy Leader's attention to the fact that the mid-term the mid review uh, indicated very strongly that uh, amongst the changes had been a greater shift towards business investment and some downward revision in private consumption. And in that sense, uh, 
those retail sales figures uh, were consistent with that. I'd also make it very clear to the uh, Leader of the Opposition that um, the uh, indicators of which I spoke last Friday when I gave the assessment I did of the Australian economy and which I repeated yesterday and I would repeat again today that they were based uh, that those assumptions and those predictions were based upon the uh, strong evidence contained in the midterm review that the growth forecast of uh, the Australian economy contained in the budget um, were continued in the eyes of the government's advisers to be valid I know that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is trying to talk the economy down. Um, it, it, is, it is his only stock in trade. I mean, you really, you really know, you really know when you've got an opposition with nothing to say. All they can ever do is talk the Australian economy down. Oh, can I say to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition? Every time you open your mouth and you talk the Australian economy down, you drag your party lower in the esteem of average Australians. The honourable member for Parramatta. Supplementary question arising out of that answer. I've uh, called the honourable member for Parramatta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Is the attorney aware of media reports that the federal government is responsible for a crisis in the New South Wales health system? Can the attorney tell the House whether there is any truth in that speculation? The I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The New South Wales legal system. The Honourable Lee, Attorney General and Minister for Justice. Order. 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 A member for Batman. The member for Prospect. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Sorry. member for Parramatta for his question. Any alleged crisis in, in relation to legal aid funding for state criminal matters in the New South Wales justice system is entirely a matter for the New South Wales government. The Commonwealth, Mr. Speaker, the Commonwealth is committed to continue funding legal aid Remember matters arising world. under Commonwealth law, but the Commonwealth expects the state and territory governments to accept their responsibilities for legal aid matters arising Order. under their law. New South Wales should accept its responsibility. Any government which exercises the right to make laws should bear the responsibility that go with that right. Money needed to fund legal aid for Commonwealth responsibilities, such as family law, the member such for as Denison. family law, has been I paying. The for Denison. Has been paying for matters which are the responsibility of the states and territories. In the last two years, approximately $10 million of Commonwealth money that should have been available for Commonwealth matters like family law, like security matters, social security matters, like immigration matters, was used to subsidise New South Wales responsibilities. Mr Speaker, the, the problem in New South Wales was created by the Hawke and Keating governments. Labor was in office for, Labor was in office for 13 years. Labor negotiated agreements with the states approximately 10 years ago, but under Labor those agreements just drifted on despite major changes in the legal landscape. They became inequitable and they became outdated. The Coalition inherited those agreements. Last June we terminated them, with effect from July this year. The Coalition unfortunately also inherited a range of serious problems in the legal aid system. The member for Canberra. Governments, Commonwealth and State, provide the bulk of money for legal aid. Under Labor, governments had no role in fixing the priorities for the use of that legal aid money. Labor allowed state and territory governments to contribute unevenly, so that there was more jurisdiction per capita in more, more money in some jurisdictions per capita than in others. The legal aid commissions in some jurisdictions were effective in recovering costs 
and in obtaining client contributions under Labor, others were allowed to drift. There is a significant inequity still prevailing in a number of areas. You have a better chance, a several times better chance in Victoria of getting legal aid for a separate representation of children and family law matters than in other places. In some jurisdictions, funds provided for the same family law matter are three times the funds provided in other jurisdictions. Under Labor, legal aid commissions were not required to keep compatible financial records or management records, seriously inhibiting planning and assessment of the effectiveness of legal aid. Seventy per cent of funding provided for referrals to private practitioners went to 20 per cent of cases. So we had a Rolls-Royce justice system for a few. What we should have had was a, a jelly bean car justice for many. Jelly bean car justice system for many. Mr Speaker, the coalition is committed to maintaining Commonwealth funding in real terms for Commonwealth matters. Any shortfall in funding for state law matters is a matter for state governments. The Honourable Member for Batman. Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Prime Minister. Are you aware in the year to last September the retail sector created 53,000 jobs, one bright spot in the employment front, the largest industry increase? Given yesterday's figures show the worst retail slump since the Menzies credit squeeze of the 60s, will you now admit your revised budget forecast on jobs is unachievable? Or is it another dimension from curability to your rare conjunction of positive circumstances? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, the, answer, the answer to the Honourable Member for uh, Batman is as follows. The uh, mid-term economic review uh, contained, uh, I think, um, uh, on the advice available uh, uh, to the Treasury, a proper assessment of where it thought the economy was going to go for the remainder of the current financial, financial year. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the forecasts that have been made have been based on the advice that's available. I think uh, the member for Batman is trying to do what the deputy leader of the opposition is trying to do, and that is to talk down the Australian economy. And uh, I might say that um, uh, I, I, mentioned, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned yesterday that um, there was nothing quite so impertinent as a group of uh, men and women who had been in charge of the affairs of this country. You drove unemployment to post-depression highs. You left us with a rate of unemployment of 8.5 per cent, and you have the absolute gall to thump the table and say, why is it? that the problem has not been fixed in a period of 11 months. I don't think the Australian people are paying any attention to a group of people who for 13 years couldn't solve a problem and yet are hypocritically demanding that we solve it in 11 months. The order. The honourable member for Sturt. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. The Treasurer will be aware of a tax loophole that has allowed banks and other financial institutions to avoid tax on the interest earned from <coughs> loans to foreign borrowers. What action is the government taking to close this loophole and ensure that all taxpayers, including the corporate sector, pay their fair share? The Honourable Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. The government has become aware that there are some Australian financial institutions entering into arrangements with non-resident corporate borrowers, which have the effect of converting accessible foreign income into tax-exempt foreign dividends. They do that by attaching sufficient voting rights to eligible finance schemes to obtain tax benefits which are afforded to direct equity investments. EFSs are excluded from the controlled foreign companies and the foreign investment funds measures because they are in effect debt and not equity. After this matter had come to the attention of the government, uh, I announced earlier this week Mr. Speaker, that the government would be taking steps to ensure that this scheme does not continue and that those companies which have entered into it are paying their fair share of tax. Uh, we will ensure uh, Mr. Speaker, that 
dividends which are in effect interest income are subject to tax by denying those dividends the exemption provided for dividends arising from a direct equity investment in a non-resident company and by denying credit for taxes paid by the non-resident company. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this is part of a number of measures which the government intends to take to tighten the application of the taxation system, particularly in relation to international measures. Shortly before Christmas, Mr Speaker, I published a discussion paper which indicated proposals for legislative change which would tighten opportunities which now exist for tax minimisation in relation to international arrangements. That paper has been published and we are receiving comment on it. Uh, let me assure the House Mr. Speaker, that this government believes that it is only fair that companies pay their fair share of tax and indeed that all taxpayers, whether they utilise international arrangements or not, are subjected to a fair share of tax in Australia. We see that as important, Mr Speaker, for keeping income tax rates down in respect of taxpayers and for ensuring that there is a fair and just distribution of the taxation burden which is necessary to fund our social security measures. The Honourable Member for Perth. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Primary Industries. In light of yesterday's very bleak a bear forecast for primary industries commodity prices, does the Minister stand by his proposition reported in the weekend Australian of January 11 and 12, and I quote, Australia should focus more on improving its exports of raw materials rather than developing processing industries? Does the Minister continue to believe that Australia's prospects for jobs and growth are best secured by dependence upon raw materials and commodities to the exports to the neglect of value-added exports. The Honourable Minister for Primary Industry and Energy. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his entirely predictable question. Uh, it is a misrepresentation of my position. I have uh, made it plain now, as I always have, that uh, we must pursue value-adding opportunities wherever we can. Many pr products in this country can and should be value-added here. That is a goal we will always pursue and we're likely to make it much more possible. Others, to which I was referring uh, when that article was written, such as wheat, as an example, face the very real probability that in the future our markets will want high quality, market differentiated but essentially unprocessed grain for their own specialist needs, and that'll be the best way to extract the best returns for wheat farmers in general, uh, in particular, and the nation in particular. But the point that I really would want to make is this. But value-adding only makes sense where Australia has a comparative advantage, and we'd have a much greater degree of comparative advantage if you'd done something decent in terms of running the economy for 13 years. That's the real point. And let me come back to the classic example, the best example of the lot. What you were doing with the meat industry in this country was value minusing, because you wouldn't get on with cutting costs in the processing sector. The returns to producers were very, very significantly cut. You were value minusing, and you wouldn't do anything about it. And what was the labour movement's response when some people in northern Australia were fortunate enough to be able to find a way out of it by going for live exports? Live exports. What was the union movement's response? Slap an export tax on them. Order. The order. The honourable member for Canning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My questions, ad my questions address to the Minister for Industrial Relations. Has the Minister seen reports of criticism by employer organisations of the government's decision to intervene in the transport industry 11 per cent pay claim now before the Australian Industrial Relations Commission? Has the Minister also seen reports that the government's argument that the claim should be heard under the new Industrial Relations legislation has failed? How does the minister respond to these reports? The Honourable Minister for Industrial Relations. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for her uh, question. In, in, in answer to the second part of the question, uh, the position is the government uh, put various submissions to the Commission, and the Commission decided to hear the entirety of the case before it brought down its uh, decision. So the claims that the government's submission had failed uh, are obviously wrong. The Commission will make its decision on all of the matters before it in due course. 
Uh, the other aspect of the question related to claims that we've been hypocritical in intervening in this particular case. I'd have to say to the uh, member, quite frankly, it would have been hypocritical for us not to intervene. Uh, because the fact is that what's happened is here is that some of the big transport companies uh, have, have accepted and paid a claim put on them as a result of a TWU claim last year. Uh, they are paying that. They're having difficulty in terms of their prices because the fact is that the unions were unable to force the same claim upon the smaller employers, and so the attempt here is basically to use the centralised system to impose the same higher cost structures on other businesses within that industry. And the reason it would be hypocritical for us not to intervene is that our long-standing position has been that wage increases ought to be tied to the productivity of the particular business. Now, there are some who say there are some benefits uh, as a result of this 11% uh, claim being uh, as part of the trade-off, and, and there may well be for some businesses. But the truth of the matter is, for a lot of these businesses, there are no benefits whatsoever for their particular enterprise. And what that means is that they would simply be forced to either lay off staff and, of course, in conjunction with that, put on higher prices. And what this claim would mean if it was passed on would simply be an inflationary hike, imposing additional costs on large sections of the Australian community, and in particular regional and rural Australia, where transport is such a significant element of the many things which they require for their families and for their businesses. So, Mr Speaker, uh, the fact is we've had an entirely consistent position. If there's any hypocrisy, if there's any hypocrisy in this issue, Mr Speaker, uh, the fact of the matter is if, if this application had been made in February of last year and the Labor Party was in government, the fact is they themselves, if they had been true to their policy position, they would take exactly the same position we are taking. Because their, their, their claim is and was at that time that they support enterprise bargaining. Well, this application clearly defies the principles of enterprise bargaining, and uh, I think it just demonstrates that it was a very hollow statement when the shadow minister said this of their industrial relations policy, and that was that it would not regress from where it was under Labor when they lost office. This actually is a classic example where you have fallen back beyond where you were in, uh, in, uh, uh, at the election time last year, and you are doing so, as usual, under the influence of the ACTU. And it's no surprise that Bill Kelty is down in the Commission today basically announcing your policy for you. The Leader of the Opposition. can't get enough of that, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that the Victorian Government has today announced its intention to consider subsidising university fees for science students as a direct result of the collapse in science and engineering enrolments following the federal government's decision to massively increase charges for those courses? Is the Prime Minister also aware that a factor in their uh, urgent consideration is his hapless minister Senator Vanstone's refusal to consider this crisis until June? Will the Prime Minister act immediately to protect Australia's excellence in science and engineering and restore education opportunity for thousands of aspiring science students? The Honourable Prime Minister. Minister. Speaker, I haven't uh, been advised of the details of that announcement, and I, I don't Order. propose, I don't propose uh, until I have acquainted myself with it, to be drawn uh, uh, with a comment. But can I take the opportunity of saying that? Um, I believe that Senator Vanstone has carried out reforms in the higher education sector with very great credibility and very great courage, and I defend, uh, I defend very strongly, I defend very strongly the decisions that she has taken. I particularly uh, compliment her on the announcements that have been made to um, conduct an inquiry into higher education in Australia. And I believe that that inquiry will well and truly focus on um, well and truly focus on some of the elements that are required to provide Australia with a world-class higher education system for the 21st century. I think um, uh, it is a mistake if uh, the leader of the opposition imagines that out there uh, a lot of people who he might uh, 
like to um, appear a little more appealing to in an electoral sense uh, imagine that there's justice in low-income people subsidising the path to high levels of income by the middle and upper classes of Australia. The order, the member for Dobell. The member for Dobell. The honourable member for Griffith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Members of the government are well aware that a dynamic small business sector is vital to economic and employment growth in Australia. Can the minister explain to the House <coughs> how government programs are creating the right conditions for growth in the small business sector? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. The member for Watson. Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, this government at least recognises that uh, small business makes an immense contribution to the Australian economy, particularly uh, as they have uh, with some $51 billion uh, of borrowings. This government is committed via responsible fiscal policy to developing a stable economy with low inflation locked in. And interest rates have already fallen, as the House knows, by one and a half percent, and some small businesses will benefit to the tune of some, on average, seven and a half thousand dollars a year in uh, in their borrowings. Now, Mr. Speaker, the government, uh, in, in setting up the Small Business Deregulation Task Force, will announce will announce its response to that task force in the very near future. But in uh, responding to that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to pick up a point uh, on the question that the member for Curtin asked yesterday. Uh, Order. Order. Now, it's, um, member for now it's interesting. I guess it's interesting, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the member for Curtin and I might add the opposition don't seem to understand Order. that what we're committed to do is to reduce by 50 uh, by 50 percent the compliance burden on small business, not the number of regulations. Now, I would, what? I would like. Will. I would like to take the member for Curtin back to the days when he had a dabble at business. As I recall, uh, Alan, it was it was Trident Homes. And I would like There's to remind the member the chamber. that if he was running a building company in those days, he wouldn't have to worry about the fringe benefits tax because order, it wasn't order, around. The, order. The he minister wouldn't... will resume his seat. The honourable member for Watson on the point of order. It's a, it's a bit difficult to understand, Mr. Speaker. Is he answering the what question? What is your point of order? My point of order is: Is he answering the question of the member for Resume Griffiths? your seat. There is or no I, point of order. I, I resume finished. your seat. But the rest of my point of I order, will Mr. not Speaker. take on a frivolous point of order. Mr. Resume your seat. But Mr. I warn the honourable member for Watson. I name the honourable member for Watson. I move that the members uh, be suspended from the service of the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Division. Division required. Ring the bells. has uh, accepted your ruling and has uh, indicated to the Leader of the House he wishes to depart, as, is it open to the Leader of the Opposition to call off the division? <laughs> I think the Honourable Minister has his response. Order. Commitment to you. 
Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the honourable member for Watson be suspended from the service of the House. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Carragamite and Riverina for the ayes and the honourable members for Port Adelaide and Fowler for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 90, noes 47. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The honourable member is suspended from the service of the House for 24 hours. Would members quickly and quietly resume their places? The honourable the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, in referring the, uh, to the point, uh, the question that uh, the member for Curtin raised yesterday, the point that I, 
the order, point that I was making. Order. Would the honourable minister resume his seat? The honourable member for Rankin on a point Mr. of order. Mr. Speaker, my point of order is on the fact that there are provisions in the in the standing rules of the House for a minister to add to an answer. The prime minister make, takes that uh, uh, opportunity often. If the minister wishes to add to the answer he gave to the member for Curtin yesterday, surely there are forms of the House to do that, and he should answer the member asked by the member for Griffith. There is no point of order. The question asked by the honourable member for Griffith is being answered. The honourable minister. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the point, the point, the point that the There's opposition. It's a wide-ranging order, and he's drawing on material that may have been relevant yesterday as the well. The point that the opposition seems to have missed, like the member for Curtin is that it's not the necessary the number. What we're committed to doing in tackling the compliance burden that has the greatest impact on small business first so that we can reduce those regulations that are the most onerous to comply with. Last, the, in the last term of the previous government, they introduced some 800 acts affecting uh, business. and In fact, uh, they introduced 600 that, uh, that affect uh, business and small business, and another 200 acts affecting small business particularly, plus a flood of subordinate legislation. What we have done, Mr uh, Speaker, in, in, in addition to the Small Business Deregulation Task Force, is committed to, to uh, taking away that compliance burden, as well as the initiative of capital gains tax rollover provision, the, uh, the, uh, the uplift factor, and importantly, of course, the, uh, the industrial relations legislation put forward by my, uh, my colleague, the Minister for Industrial Relations. The point I was making in using as an example the member for Curtin, if he can recall those days, if he were in business today, he'd be worried about capital gains tax that he didn't used to have, he'd be worried about fringe benefits tax, occupational health and safety, and a whole range of other compliance costs that the other government, the previous government, imposed on small business that we're going to strip away. And I would have thought that the opposition and the member for Curtin would have gone out and sold to small business that very positive message that this government's doing something for small business. The order. Order the honourable member for Prospect. I thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'd like to address my question without notice to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, are you aware that a single income family with a child under five living in Wollstonecraft and earning 62,000 per year is entitled to Part B of the government's family tax package. But a family from Fairfield in my electorate, also with a child under five, on as little as 17,000 per year and receiving close to the maximum parenting allowance, does not qualify for Part B. Is it the view from Kirribilli, Prime Minister, that causes you to punish approximately 140,000 battling families whilst giving free kicks to those who live in the North Shore. Yeah. Yeah. Honourable the Prime Minister. <laughs> well, we're, 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 getting, we're getting some good old Labor Party class politics back into the. Oh, yes, 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 some good old Labor Party. We've got our Labor Party class politics back. Well, let me let me say let me say an answer to um, Order. let me say an answer to the uh, to the member that the the family tax package does not punish anyone. So you're in fact what the family tax package does what the family tax package does is to is to provide is to provide for every family. Every family under a certain level of income, and the, the level of income is uh, is in the order of seventy thousand dollars a year, uh, with uh, with increments according to the number of children. It provides for every eligible family to be better off. So the the fundamental the fundamental mistake of the honourable member's question is that nobody is punished. A large number of Australian families, indeed two million Australians, are in fact enhanced under our family tax initiative. And I am, I am delighted. I am delighted that the that the member opposite regards a measure that adds to the uh, situation of families. I am delighted to see, from a political point of view, that the member opposite regards that as punishing families. What the member has obviously forgotten, of course, is that every eligible family, whether it's a single income family or a double income family, is entitled to a tax reduction in respect of every child. Over and above that, and something for which 
Uh, my government makes absolutely no apology at all, whether people live in Wollstonecraft or in Fairfield or in Parramatta or in Burwood or in Strathfield or Malvern or, uh, or, or wherever, or Claremont or wherever they might live, wherever you like. Uh, I, I, I make absolutely no apology for the fact that what our family tax measure has done has been to redress some of the imbalance against single income families within the system that we inherited. I'm very proud of that. It punishes nobody. It benefits two million Australians. The Honourable Member for Leichhardt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Given the uh, government's Order. commitment to small business and creating jobs, can the minister outline immigration initiatives his uh, in his portfolio that impact on regional Australia and particularly in my electorate of Leichhardt? The Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Well, I do thank the Honourable Member for Leichhardt for his question, Mr Speaker, because small business is obviously very important in regional Australia. And one of, the ways in which, uh, one of the ways in which we can help small business in regional Australia is to ensure that they're able to fill highly, highly skilled vacancies when they occur, when they can't be filled in the Australian job market. And one of the key responses for being able to do that is through the Regional Sponsored Migration Scheme. Now, that scheme requires an approved regional body to certify a skill shortage so that we're not taking jobs away from other Australians. And I can inform the House that I've just approved of additional regional authorities under the scheme. And of particular interest to the member for Leichhardt will be that I've approved the uh, Cairns Chamber of Commerce. I've also approved the Winton Shire Council and the electorate of Kennedy and the Queensland uh, Department of Economic Development and Trade. And these add to a number of other impressive bodies in North Queensland who are involved in the scheme. The Gulf Local Authorities Development Association, the Cape York Peninsula Development Association, the Mount Isa Townsville Economic Zone. And I want to thank the honourable member, and also I might say the honourable member for Kennedy, who has been an enthusiastic uh, supporter of this particular scheme for Queensland in particular. Um, they've been taking and encouraging bodies uh, to be involved in this work, and I'm very much appreciative of that. There are now 15 approved regional bodies, which cover a significant part of regional Australia. They cover all of South Australia, Tasmania, the Northern Territory much of regional Queensland and significant parts of Western Australia, New South Wales and Victoria, and I'd welcome other members to be associated with this important initiative in getting a better dispersed outcome in relation to our migration program. The Honourable Member for Kalgoorlie. Mr Speaker, in the absence of the Minister of Defence, I address this to the Prime Minister. In the order, foreign, order, foreign affairs, order, order, Minister the, Foreign Affairs. The Honourable Member for Kalgoorlie, the Minister for Defence is in the chamber. Yeah, look, uh, I didn't mean Minister for Health. I meant uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> yeah. no, well. and I say to the Prime Minister, in 1991, at the Strategic Defence Conference in Canberra, the head of Indonesia's equivalent, or equivalent organisation, Dr Joseph Wanandi— Order. Order. Would you begin your question again? With, with pleasure, Mr Speaker. In 1990— It's the Prime Minister. In 1991, at a Strategic Defence Studies Conference in Canberra, the head of Indonesia's equivalent organisation, Dr Joseph Wanandi, foreshadowed a continuation of the present Indonesian policy and said that if and when the mass movement of people in Asia, for any reason, occurs, the ensuing chaos may well manifest itself to the entire region in the form of continuing waves of boat people. Mr Wanandi said that the Indonesian policy would be to instruct these people to pass through and not stop at the archipelago. There was no response from Australia at the time. I ask you, Prime Minister, do we have a response now? If so, what is it? If not, why not? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, I, and I, don't, I don't mean in any way to be offensive to the Honourable Member. I, I understand the question, the Honourable Member will correct me, uh, invites a response now in, in February of 1997 to something that was said at a conference in 1991 and uh, by, uh, by, a, by a, a person from Indonesia. Can I say that uh, I don't think uh, it's um, appropriate for me to uh, give a response in relation to a comment that was made something like six and a half to seven years ago 
uh, while another government was in power. But I will take the opportunity of saying that uh, we have a well-established uh, uh, attitude to uh, the arrival of people in this country. We do not take the view, nor, as I understood it, did the former government take the view that uh, people have the right to uh, arrive willy-nilly in this country without normal processes. And I think there is very strong support in the Australian community for a regime that says that if people arrive here except in a regular fashion, they ought with uh, no undue delay uh, to, uh, to be returned unless they can establish an entitlement on proper criteria to asylum or refugee status. Now that is a fair international principle. It's one uh, that my government will certainly adhere to very, very strongly, and I want to take the opportunity of giving that assurance to the Australian people. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate for me to say anything more. <coughs> the Honourable Member for North Sydney. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Transport and Regional Development. Can the Minister advise the House Order. what steps the government is taking to fulfil its election commitments to more equitably share the burden of aircraft noise around Sydney Airport. The Honourable Minister for Transport and Regional Development. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for North Sydney for his question. He's taken a particular personal interest in this and has done a lot of work to try and ensure that there is a more equitable distribution of aircraft noise over Sydney to ensure a sense of fairness prevails in Sydney following the years of neglect and mismanagement uh, by the former Labor government during their time when the aircraft noise problem became an enormous issue in Sydney that led to enormous distress amongst people who were affected by it, to disruptions, to demonstrations and indeed to the loss of property values as a consequence of the former Labor government's mismanagement of the aircraft noise problem in Sydney. When uh, this government came to power in March last year, we had a philosophy, a policy of equitably sharing the aircraft noise problem. We also said that we wished to reduce the number of aircraft movements to the north, which was where the bulk of aircraft movements were focused, by half. And we also said that we wanted to maximise aircraft movements over water and non-residential land, and we also wanted to reopen the east-west runway. Well, within eight working days of being sworn into office, we reopened the east-west runway. We have changed a number of the operations at the airport to ensure that aircraft movements in the early hours of the morning are mostly whether permitting over water rather than over the suburbs. And indeed, we had uh, recently uh, allowed takeoffs to the north on the new third runway, uh, a fact which was uh, denied, uh, or an opportunity which was denied the uh, airport operators uh, under the management of the previous government. As part of our plan, we've also instituted a major review of all of the flight paths for Sydney, the Sydney Basin. That review was presented to me on December 16. It was undertaken by Air Services Australia and also involved in the working group, Mr Speaker, uh, a number of people who represented the anti-aircraft noise uh, people uh, throughout Sydney. The Coalition of Airport Action Groups was the peak body of anti-aircraft noise protesters. Two of their representatives formed the working group and made a very positive and, and indeed welcome contribution to that review that was presented to me on December 16. I released the review in its full detail earlier today. Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to say that the review recommends changes which will see <coughs> aircraft movements to the north of Mascot Airport drop from where they were at 50 per cent of the total of aircraft movements, drop from 50 per cent to 16.75 per cent. As a consequence of these recommendations, it will see aircraft movements to the east of Mascot Airport around 13 per cent of the total, to the west of Mascot Airport at 15 per cent of the total, and indeed it will see the majority of aircraft movements in Sydney uh, taking place over water and non-residential land to the south of Mascot Airport, for some 55 per cent of the total will operate to the south of the airport. This achieves our, our uh, policy positions that we enunciated in the run-up to the election. It achieves the uh, goal of reducing the aircraft noise that uh, affects pe so many people. In the process, uh, if this policy, these recommendations are implemented, uh, it will see the numbers of people who are the worst affected by aircraft noise, the people in the ANEF uh, uh, factor of 30, 
It sees those worst affected people reduce in number from some 11,000 people to 4,000. So what this means is that some 7,000 people who are very seriously affected by aircraft noise will have that problem taken away from them. The big winners in all of this, uh, Mr Speaker, will be, of course, uh, people who live directly to the north of the airport in suburbs such as Marrickville, uh, Petersham, Leichhardt, uh, Sydenham, those areas that are strong Labor areas that have been supporting the Labor Party for as long as there's been an election for a federal government. These are the people who could have had these changes, which would have reduced the number of aircraft over their heads from one in every two down to less than one in every five. These changes could have been made by the former Labor government, but they didn't have the initiative and the drive and the determination to make those changes. And indeed, it only took a coalition government for the, for, with it, the fulfilment of its policies to deliver these sorts of changes and these sorts of benefits. And so, Mr Speaker, I was very pleased to be able to launch these recommendations uh, here today in the House, or sorry, in the in Parliament House, earlier this morning, and I am sure that with the implementation of this, following further public comment, and I invite further public comment on these recommendations for the next four weeks, I am sure that following that further public comment that we will, under a coalition government, achieve the goal we set out to achieve some time ago now, and that is of an equitable distribution of aircraft noise over Sydney, the maximisation of aircraft movements over water and non-residential land. The only question in my mind is why didn't it happen before? Perhaps it was because the former Minister for Transport was enjoying the view from his house in Palm Beach. <laughs> Order the Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Family Services. It concerns the failure by the Minister to answer my question yesterday. Is the Minister aware of a report which says, uh, and I quote in part, Miss Mulcahy, a parent in Townsville, does not concur that her childcare costs will only go up by 56 cents a week? Indeed, her, her new calculations show the cost will increase by $38.03 per week. Will the minister table any additional advice provided by her office to Ms Mulcahy about her childcare fees? Will the minister also now confirm that the additional cost of childcare for this Townsville family as a result of this year's budget will be $38.03 a week extra? Does the minister stand by her claim in this House that that family will, now, will not now pay an additional $0.56 cents a week? Rather, thirty-eight dollars a week. The honourable minister for family services. Order. Well, Mr. Speaker, last week it was fifty-six dollars a week extra. This week it's thirty-eight dollars a week extra. Uh, what, what, what is the truth? Order. What is the truth? The member for Dobell. Well, well, Order. Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, in relation to that specific case referred, referred to, and on the information Order. that has been provided, my department assure me that those calculations are correct, and I have already given that answer to this House. A person with a person with work-related uh, claim, including some time for travel, uh, for more than 50 hours of care, will continue to receive childcare assistance for those hours worked, those additional hours worked. This measure is fair, it's equitable, and the taxpayers should not be expected to subsidise services that are not being provided but being paid for by this government. The order. The, the question has been asked and answered. The honourable member for Page. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Sport, Territories and Local Government. Minister, have any statistics been released recently to show how many people are employed in the sport and recreation industry throughout Australia? What is the government doing to encourage sport and recreation activities? The Honourable Minister for Sport, Territories and Local Government. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Yes, I have uh, seen some statistics that were released uh, uh, just recently by the Australian Bureau of Statistics indicating the level of uh, expenditure in uh, sport uh, in Australia. Interestingly, there is an employment level of some 80,000 people directly 
uh, in some 7,000 uh, businesses and organisations right around Australia. That doesn't include the additional numbers that run into many thousands that are involved in the uh, multiplier effect of industries and uh, employment opportunities yeah, that are associated uh, with those industries. But that number itself is very significant. The total value, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, is somewhere in the vicinity of about $2.5 billion, which certainly is a very large amount. But one of the areas that we do know that is expanding and is an area of growth is in the recreation industries, and many of the people involved in those industries are, of course, employed in small businesses. It should be, it should be known by members that it's more than $7 billion are spent on recreation by Australians from their household budgets. The statistics show that it's the fourth highest spending area of a household budget behind food, transport and housing. There's a very significant amount of Australians uh, spend their money on those particular areas. They're spent on areas in small businesses such as gyms, swimming pools, bowling centres, indoor cricket facilities and so on. And these, these are the businesses that are the very target of the government to ensure that these small businesses can take advantage of this very large expenditure by Australian households. And indeed, my colleague, the member for small business, will be responding shortly on behalf of the government for the excellent work done by the Small Business Task Force, and I'm sure that that will be eagerly awaited uh, by many Australians. Another issue, another issue that we've undertaken has been to appoint uh, a special representative to promote uh, sport export development, uh, Mr Kevin Gosper, who will be well known to many in this place. And also I announced just prior to Christmas the uh, launch of the program in conjunction with my colleague, the Minister for Health, Active Australia. And Active Australia uh, is a program to encourage Australians to be involved in a wide range of recreational and sporting activities. And I have to say, uh, in answer to the uh, member's question, that we do recognise on this side of the House of the importance of sport, Bell. the importance of recreation as an industry in its own right, where we have $7 billion plus spent by Australians on these activities, and also we see it as a job generator, a growth industry, which we will be doing everything we can to support and encourage. The Honourable Member for Fremantle. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Family Services. Is the Minister aware of a recent study conducted by the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research and the National Institute of Economic and Industry Research, which shows that when fully implemented, the government's budget measures will leave most Australian households worse off? Is she also aware that the study shows that unemployed households stand to lose $38 a week? Households whose main income is a disability or wife's pension stand to lose $21.50 per week? and sole parent families will lose $10.70 per week. Given her responsibility for families, what is the minister going to do to protect these struggling families from the effects of the Howard Costello budget? The Hon. Minister for Family Services. Uh, well, uh, Order. well, the fact is uh, that under the uh, analysis, an independent analysis done by the National Centre for Social and Economic yeah, Modelling. Right. This has shown that the Family Tax Initiative will achieve its objective of ensuring families with children, especially, especially single income Order. families, will have very adequate levels of, of income. And, um, and I, have to say, Mr. I have to say, Mr Speaker, that in all of the, uh, in all of the measures that we have taken in relation to families and children, we have ensured that we have given the maximum protection to those in the low and medium income brackets. We have delivered, we have delivered uh, fair and just policies. And can I say also, uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister answered the question on the benefits of the Family Tax Initiative very well in this place earlier. But in, in just adding a point to that, I think there are, real, there are real cash benefits being delivered to Australian families from that measure. But more importantly, uh, Mr Speaker, it has uh, signalled to Australian families that this government uh, puts uh, Australian families first and makes them central uh, to policy decision making. Uh, and families are, are clearly a very important part of our community. That has been recognised by this government. Uh, we have further strengthened that by our strengthening families policy as well. So these measures together 
are particularly beneficial to families. The Honourable Member for Dixon. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Is the Minister aware of the decision by the Franchising Code Council to cease trading with effect from 31 December 1996? Having regard to the importance of this matter to many of my constituents and to Australians engaging or proposing to engage in these businesses, can the Minister explain why the Code Council has decided to cease trading and what effect this decision will have on the growing franchising sector? Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Mr Speaker, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for his question, a uh, matter that uh, he has written to me on as well. Uh, I regret I have got to inform members of the House that uh, the Franchising Code Council has been, been una unable to uh, solve its internal problems and has chosen to cease trading. I understand that uh, an administrator uh, has been appointed and a decision will be made by the end of this month as to what to do with the Code Council in their uh, respect. The government, the government allocated $648,000 to the, to the Council this financial year. I met with the Council in October to discuss the need to modify the strategic plan which they had developed under the former government and to prioritise their activities to achieve self-funding status by 1997 uh, 8 and onwards. At a subsequent meeting of the Council, it was clear that most members were willing to do this. I understand that the draft strategic plan along these lines was in fact prepared. Based on discussions with the Council I had myself and my officials, I agreed to seek an increase in the subsidy by another $152,000 to be paid in the 1997-8 financial year. This brought the subsidy to $800,000 over two years, which should have been more than enough to achieve the transition to self-sufficiency. In spite of this, there were some council members who were unprepared to modify their position to, the meet, to meet the new financial circumstances. In November and December, I understand that the council twice considered a resolution to wind up on the basis that they didn't have the funds to implement the old strategic plan. Both these resolutions were defeated the then chairman of the council, Mr Bob Gardini, resigned. Mr Michael Delaney, a representative of franchise E interests on the council, wrote to me in December to indicate that, notwithstanding the council's decision to continue, he had convened another meeting to consider winding up. I note the press release issued by the council when it ceased trading indicated that it was unable to carry on because of threats of legal action against the company, its directors and its officers. In effect, the Council seems to have been destroyed by dissension from within the, the industry. Self-regulation can own, only be effective if all members of the self-regulatory body can work together and have the support of the industry as a whole. A fresh start will enable that to happen. I am discussing with industry interest whether alternative self-regulatory mechanisms can be put into place. Of course, the issue of fair trading practices in relation, to the in, in relation to franchising is being considered by the Fair Trading Inquiry. The government looks forward to the committee's report due in May. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Canberra. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Order. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Industrial Relations. I ask, uh, given the recent figures on inflation and wage growth, why is the government persisting with what must be the lowest wage offer it, it thinks it can get away with, a mere $8 per week? rather than a larger increase when the figures uh, make it clear that an increase of at least $14 per week would be consistent with the Reserve Bank of Australia's wage and inflation targets. Won't your failure to respond in this way to protect the interests of low-paid workers, most of whom don't have mortgages, mean they'll miss out on about $1,000 per year because of your policy? The Honourable Minister for Industrial yeah, Relations. You got the, you got the, <laughs> well, I must say I do thank the Honourable Member for his uh, question. I, I mean, what, what, I suppose if you wanted to find a sort of point of sensitivity on the Labor side about their last 13 years, is the fact that you never delivered really wage increases for the low paid. I mean, you, the party that claimed to be interested in the battlers, the fact, the fact is you, you delivered for them declining real wages, 
high unemployment, and then you had the incredible gall to say that the success of your policy was that you were reducing the wages of the low paid. And it, it must knock you incredibly to see us down there before the Commission with a package which provides real wage increases for the low paid. And then, and then just, to, just, to in, just to inflame your, your anxiety, your anxiety. It must have been a shock to you when the latest CPI figures came out and revealed the significance of the benefit which will flow to the uh, low income earners of this country as a result of that $8 uh, wage increase. So, Mr. Speaker, thank you, thank you very much to the Shadow Minister for the question. Uh, I'm very interested in, uh, in his interest in this subject matter because the truth of the matter is that your record in government was one of the significant factors which led to your well-deserved loss last March. Order. The Honourable Member for McEwen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I direct my question to the Minister for Sport, Territories and Local Government. Is it a fact that in the lead-up to the Olympics many sportsmen and women and their families will be looking to see various parts of Australia, like, for example, the Yarra Valley, uh, the wonderful Lake Eildon and the historic Central Highlands and the magnificent electorate of McEwen. Uh, further, Minister, given the fact that Tasmania has special access problems for tourists, what action is the government taking to ensure that overseas sporting figures can visit the island state? And are there any early indications that the government's decisions are already showing early signs of success in the key job-creating area of tourism? The Honourable Minister for Sports, Territories and Local Government. Um, I thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I, I thank the, um, the member for McEwen for her very well-constructed question. Um, <laughs> There, there are indeed um, two, uh, two points that the uh, member raises. The first is uh, the opportunity that the Olympics provides uh, Australia, but particularly the opportunity that arises in advance of the Olympics with visiting sporting teams, their coaches and their families. And indeed, uh, we believe there will be many thousands over the next uh, couple of years up to the Games in 2000 that will be visiting Australia. To provide information to national sporting organisations and uh, people involved in sport internationally, the government has released a directory covering all sporting venues right around Australia, and I commend it to members because many communities are trying to entice, are trying to entice uh, sporting uh, groups and uh, sporting bodies to come to Australia. And in doing so, uh, they need to be able to understand the level of facilities, and all states and New Zealand are covered in this directory. The second point that the uh, member raises is, uh, relates to uh, Tasmania, and I thank the member for that particular uh, matter that she's raised. There are difficulties uh, that have been demonstrated because of the neglect of uh, some 13 years by the former government about the needs of Tasmania and uh, trying to underpin a long-term growth industry tourism. What the government did on the 1st of September, through the uh, good work of the Minister for Transport and Regional Development, Mr Sharp, was to announce the Pass Strait Passenger Vehicle Equalisation Scheme, which built on a decision that this government made some 20 years ago when the Prime Minister was then Treasurer about the Bass Strait Equalisation Scheme to underpin the viability of Tasmanian industry. And what that scheme has done has seen a dramatic, a dramatic increase in the visitation of tourists to Tasmania. Indeed, I'm advised that the figures have seen a 17 per cent passenger increase, a 30 per cent increase in cars up until the 31st of December last year. That is a dramatic increase that benefits all the small businesses that are involved in tourism. It provides an opportunity for visiting Order. sporting teams to get to Tasmania to take advantage of the excellent facilities there. But more importantly, uh, members and Prime Minister, the forward bookings, the forward bookings show a 23 per cent increase in passenger bookings and a 40 per cent increase in cars to June 1997. This is a dramatic turnaround because of this scheme, the assistance that's been given uh, to Tasmania in recognising the development of tourism, the opportunities for sporting bodies to visit Tasmania and indeed all members of the House and their families to take advantage of that opportunity. Prime Minister. Further questions be placed on the notice paper. And, uh, could I...